Coming up on Techzilla, speed up your PC for free. How does my $650 projector compare to a $6,500 projector? Bet the answer won't surprise you. Apple's dongle upgrading from 32 to 64 bit, cracking secure bits, and hey, let's fix one of Google's maps. So heat up that leftover mac and cheese and get under your magic blankie, because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is made possible by Jack Threads, West Host, offering premium web hosting since 1998, and Audible.com. Get a free audiobook at audiblepodcast.com slash Techzilla. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Welcome to Techzilla, hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Hey, whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or you want to know how to get a 7,000-pound truck with a burnt transmission back on the highway, We've got an answer for you. And we actually don't need to contact anyone for help on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Firefox 4 is here. I have not even looked at it yet. The wait is, you should. I, I, okay. I'm running it on my, 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 my desktop machine at work. Very excited. It's actually, it's pretty neat. Three years after Firefox 2, two years after Firefox 3.5, Doubled IE9's 24-hour download run, and the 24 hours wasn't up when I checked last. Uh, possibly because it runs on XP, unlike IE9. Enough rah, rah we should talk features. New interface, emphasis on minimal. A lot of old school Firefox fans may not like the new interface because it is super stripped. It, it makes Chrome seem busy. I am looking forward to that <laughs> now, actually. That's one thing I wanted changed. Faster browsing, more HTML5 support, uh, sync, add-ons that don't require a restart, and tab grouping called Panorama. Lifehacker did a really cool browser speed test pitting Firefox 4, IE9, Chrome 11, and Opera 11 against each other. This was a test of each browser's aggregate performance and cold starts, nine tab loading, JavaScript, DOM, CSS, and memory use. The results, finishing first, Opera 76%, Chrome 10 stable 76%, Chrome 11 dev 68%, Firefox 4 60%, IE9, oh, 24% for the 64-bit and 28% for the 32-bit. Wah, wah, wah. So the thing is, though, they are all really fast. Firefox square in the middle, PC Mags review. Uh, Michael Muchmore, buddy from over ExtremeTech.com. Hi, Michael. Hey, four out of five stars. Props to the Ooh. sleek interface, speed, group tabbing, the ability to pin sites. We like this one. And syncing service or tabs across the internet. Still a little cool. critical of the speed compared to Chrome and IE9, although according to Lifehacker, they shouldn't be that critical about that. But I think it also depends on how you test browser performance, which is a little fuzzy. Um, probably, I, I think... It, I, I'm it running it. it. I'm, I'm excited. I've been having a lot of problems with Flash and Chrome lately. Mm -hmm. It seems like every day I'm having the, the entire thing just collapse and burn. So I need to try it with a different browser to see mm -hmm. if I have issues similar to that. And I think I, or basically Firefox 4 would be a good one to, you know, an excuse to dip my toe in the water and see how it is. Well, it's been a long time since I've used Firefox regularly. We will see how no, me it too. compares. Time to, time to make the, nah, <laughs> at least try it out and see what it's like. Yeah. Hey, speaking of browsers, George wrote in this comment about IE9. It says, hi all, IE9 may be Chrome in speed, but IE9 just doesn't work for many sites out there. They have major issues with iframes, which are all over the web. Did you notice that even Microsoft.com, the website, has this tag in it? Ah, uh, notice the part there that says IE equals emulate IE8. Uh, this basically <laughs> tells the browser to use IE8 compatibility mode when you browse their site with IE9. Even Microsoft doesn't want their, <laughs> doesn't support their own sweet new browser. Sign, cheers, George. And the browser wars rage on. It's a process Whoa. of evolution. Darn hey, it. If you're wondering how uh, cheap PCs have gotten, Robert in Dallas, Texas writes in, once upon a time, there was a new PC architecture I have no idea how this got digitized. I hope I never lose it. Pass it on, Robert in Dallas, Texas. And of course, you're looking at the Tandy. Wow. Tandy I, action. I, I clearly remember seeing that system at a friend's house and lusting over the fancy pants color display that it had. Uh, my beloved 8088 with its amber monochrome <laughs> display and dual, dual five and a quarter inch floppies was truly starting to show its age right around then. I, I would also note, taking a look at that advertisement, I don't see a hard drive even listed in there yet. Right. And let alone, there was no hard drive in my 8088 either. Micro-channel architecture support was probably the only, I think Tandy was the only company outside of IBM that ever touched IBM's micro-channel architecture. That is, my 80, old 8088 is the one of the few computers where I don't know what happened to it. I can't recall where it ended up. I think I had every other computer I've ever owned. It's in Cabo. Scary. Cabo. Maybe. Somebody's using it, hopefully. <laughs> hey, 
You got something cool you want to share with the Techzilla crew? Maybe an email question? Techzilla at revision3.com is the address. Or tweet us at Techzilla, at Veronica, at Patrick Norton, at Robert Heron. Fire them out, folks. We'd love to hear from you. And I just got to say, I'm, I'm digging the whole direct messaging thing on Twitter. So that requires people to actually follow me. Also so. requires you following other people. Not for me to respond with a direct message, but if they want to direct message me, it's too, <laughs> there's just too many people involved for me to be friending everyone or following everyone, but we'll I'll just try. You will try, try nobly. I will. His goal is noble. We talk a lot about hardware upgrades, dumping your old hard drive for a solid state drive to speed up startup, not to mention every file you open, everything you do on your PC, the right GPU makes even the gnarliest new games look gorgeous. And hey, a new CPU and more memory, they are the mother load of PC performance. They also cost a pile of cash, mm -hmm. which might be a little tight as we head down toward tax day. So let's talk about speeding up your PC for free. And at the top of my list would be updating your drivers. This especially graphics drivers. Graphics drivers make a big difference, yeah. especially in compatibility and also performance upgrades, especially if you just bought a fancy new card. Chances are they weren't fully optimized when it left the factory. <laughs> the operating system, there's no excuse there either. Most operating systems nowadays will update themselves if you just let it happen. Just do it. Also, update your applications. Every app is constantly, well, if it's a good app, especially with games, yeah. you'll know this for sure, but no software leaves the company unfinished. So go find that patch. <laughs> it can help with not only performance, but security issues as well. It's really important. Also, Windows, has it been on your system for at least a year? Consider the fresh install. It eliminates all that bit rot and God knows what else. You, you, some horrible stuff can be lurking in the background I'm, of the uh, system. I'm currently torturing my workstation because its, it's, it's uh, OS days are numbered right now. It's going to get a fresh mind wipe and a clean install of Windows 7. And I'm, uh, I'm pretty much abusing it until that day happens, which should be in the next, I'd say, week. I feel for that. I pity that system. Defrag, one of my favorite speed tips. Essentially, it's housekeeping for your hard drive. It moves the file data around and gives big, continuous blocks of data instead of having it scattered around your drive so the head has to jump from place to place. Windows Defrag is painfully slow. Check out iobit.com for Smart Defrag 2. It's free, it's fast, it's a very good tool. For your defrag, I gotta say, a lot of times it'll be like, your disk is 5% defragmented. <laughs> you don't need to defrag. Defrag, trust yeah. me. Because I've, I've seen amazing performance differences just because if your data is crufted all over the hard drive, cleaning it up can do really nice things for performance. Before you defrag, take a look at how much space is left in your drive. If you're under a gig or worse yet, down to a couple hundred megabytes, back stuff off to another drive, put it on online storage or just delete it. This might be more in sort of you're cleaning up dad or, or, or Aunt Sue or whoever's machine. Just Trust me, get some space in there. Like probably, I would say a minimum of, of 10 to 15 percent, 20 percent totally. is better. Otherwise, Windows will actually pop up a warning if you don't have <laughs> enough disk space before it'll try to defragment the drive. And you can always go into the properties of the individual drive, hard drive, and take a look at a tool section, and they'll have something called disk cleanup. And that makes it really checkbox options. Mm -hmm. Pretty safe to do overall. Loose is fast. Don't Always. stuff your drive too hard. Also, kill off your background apps and oh, processes yeah. that you don't need. Hit Control Alt Delete, open the Task Manager, click on the Processes tab, and take a close look at what's running. Lots of stuff you shouldn't touch are, is definitely in there, but you can also find lots of stuff that you don't need, especially on big name PCs like stupid help apps that add 30 seconds to your boot up time every time you start your computer. You might have to take these apps out of the startup, uh, basically from inside the app. Like you inside? go to you know, startup, like you go into like you know options and settings. And that I usually do for anything right next to the clock. Those mm -hmm. items that are sitting in the tray like that, go through and try to disable them within the app itself, like you mentioned. Right Otherwise, click. you can also check the in the start menu folder structure. There's the startup folder. You can check right. there, or you can type in basically hit search and type in shell colon startup yeah. and hit enter to bring up yet another tool for you to look through things it's that are starting up. It's basically one of the, it's like the, that'll actually bring up the startup folder where, where oh. startup icons are drugged. Or if you're really pissed off at something you can't figure out how to get it to stop booting when your system boots, enter MS config in the start menu, hit enter, click on the startup tab in the, in the box that shows up and start unchecking things. It'll give you a list of every single thing that starts when you start your PC. I, again, be considering in the back of your head, hey, maybe it's time to wipe that hard drive and start fresh with a new install of Windows whatever, or whatever your operating system of choice is. Yes. Although it seems to be more of a Windows thing than... Seems to, the pain seems to be more Windows than OS X or, or Linux. I'll find my Ubuntu installer. I don't use OS X or an Apple computer regularly, so I'm not sure how often that could use a, a mind wipe, so Less to speak. Less than Windows. It seems that way. <laughs> more than the average OS X user. That is my perception admit. of the situation. 
you got a burning tech question for us, whether it's actually about burning tech, we've, we've seen that, <laughs> or just a very urgent question, send it in text, at revision 3com is the email address, or you can post it on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash techzilla. Let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, Jack Threads. If you're a guy, statistically, there's a chance you hate shopping for clothes. You should be checking out Jack Threads. It's a members only online shopping club that does the dirty work for you and saves you a boatload of cash. Everyday Jack Threads serves up the hottest brands at up to 80% off what you'd pay in a store. Brands like Kid Robot, The Hundreds, and American Apparel for way less than you find anywhere else. And did we mention it's free to join? Hit up jackthreads.com slash tech, that's T-E-K with a K, and you'll instantly start saving and you won't even have to leave the house. Time to get our HD Nation on. Yeah, and although I loathe dongles in general, that did not stop me from stopping by the Apple Store and spending 40 bucks 40. On, the, on the company's new digital AV adapter. This essentially provides me with HDMI output. Got an SD, is it an SD card slot? You know, no, that's the first it. thing I tried to stick in there, but it's just a pass through for the uh, power and syncing cable, so Dude. I can leave that connected as well. That said, hey, the adapter itself is compatible with iPads, both uh, the fourth generation mm -hmm. iPod Touch and like this, the iPod, iPhone 4. Now, uh, mirroring, which if you want to mirror the iOS interface, that's only supported by the iPad 2. Aww. And the iPad 2 is the only compatible Apple product that supports 1080p video output. Not that we've seen this so-called 1080p output. <laughs> if somebody would hand me the iPad 2, I will try it tonight. However, uh, the basically the iPads, the iPods, and the iPhone 4 are limited to 720p video output. And this is where it gets interesting. Yes. Of course, I did successfully, unsuccessfully try to put 1080p <laughs> video on this thing, but iTunes just wouldn't even allow me to import the file. I think it does a resolution check before right. you, it, it, at least in my case. I imagine if I had the iPad 2, it would be fine. Anyway, 720p videos looked and played just fine. I even encoded a few of the uh, 720p test patterns that are some of my favorites using Handbrake, basically to test the encoder performance and to check the output quality, and it all looked pretty darn good. Now, I compared the encodes that are optimized for the iPhone 4's native 960 by 640 resolution to 720p output, and I noticed that the 720p output actually looked noticeably better when viewed on a large screen 1080p HD TV. Did they look better or worse on the iPhone itself? Or did uh, very hard to tell the difference. Right. With the smaller screen and the smaller pixel density or the tighter pixel density, mm -hmm. I really didn't notice a difference. But when I blew the picture up, compression artifacts were a lot more noticeable on the iPhone formatted content than it was, say, with straight 720p video. File size particularly? different between I, those two? If you're aiming for a specific file size to go for, I'd say give it about one gigabyte mm -hmm. per hour for 720p right. video in so MPEG-4. Were the iPhone 4 optimized files smaller than the 720p files? Not really. Files? They're pretty okay. similar in size. Uh, maybe within, I don't know, I'd say about 20% okay. of each. In addition to encoded videos, of course, the uh, digital AV adapter makes easy to do an impromptu slideshow. And videos from a Netflix Instant Cube played just fine as well. The really the only downside to this setup, at least in my eyes, is it relates to the player software. I can encode a 5.1 audio track on a video, but I'm not seeing a way to select it. And the same goes for subtitles that aren't burned right into the video itself. Right. So if you're trying to get selectable, you know, I'd like subtitles to appear. I know there's subtitles in that video stream. I don't see a control that allows you to do anything like that. And that's more, I believe, just a limitation of the player software right. that's on the phone itself. Well, also, there's no subtitles in iTunes itself. So oh. why would anybody possibly want support for subtitles? I can encode them in there. Universe. Now, I guess if, you're, if it's important to you, you can just right. burn those directly into the video itself. But then it's always going to be on there. And you can't make it appear or disappear, as you prefer. They could really spice up the video player on here. I still have VLC installed on my phone. It's not the best app. It, I don't think they had the optimization in there. But I, I can see you drilling through Apple's voicemail system to find Jonathan <laughs> Ives' mailbox. Bro, it's time to spice <laughs> up the iPhone video interface. I did play a Windows Media video file, though, with the VLC app. That mm -hmm. was pretty funny to me. On the, I'm <laughs> off topic. Anyway, not bad for a $40 investment. It gives me HDMI output. So if, if you're a business traveler and, and you have access to HDMI you know, inputs on television when you travel, if you're looking for a way to drag stuff over to a friend's house. Totally. And the Netflix, actually the Netflix streaming looks pretty darn good considering, uh, even blowing it up to 1080p resolution. It was pretty nice. Oh, and to, just to let you know, the output on the HDMI coming out of my phone, it, it seems to be scaling everything to 720p. And I hmm. imagine that might go up to 1080p with the iPhone, iPad 2. Good to know. Yeah. MotoGP coming next week. Oh, 
Round two. <laughs> or MotoGP coming this week. MotoGP started last weekend, right. and it is some of the best HD racing content on TV, folks. I'm, I'm a happy camper. We, we haven't talked about what we're watching in a while. <laughs> so I figured mention he's watching MotoGP, and I'm trying to get through season two of Glee. Glee. Apparently I'm going back to high school with the Glee. places. <laughs> <laughs> my projector, my Woot.com deal of the day, my Optoma 1080p showed up and was immediately taken out of my hands and put into Robert Heron's hands. I didn't even get to take it home no. for a rigor. <laughs> he had to do the rigorous benchmark testing. He fired up SpectraCal's excellent CalMan calibration and testing software. I had to keep things consistent with our other front projector test results. He used the same Stuart Phelps Green Studio Tech 100 screen that features a matte white surface that is low gain for even dispersion of reflected light and works approximately three to four times the projector of the Optoma 1080p, at least the refurbished version that I It's bought. a consistent screen surface to shoot at. It's really good. Hey, <laughs> you know what? The uh, HD 180, Patrick's new projector, it features yeah. a single chip DLP light edge and similar, similar in fact, to the uh, digital projections MVision SYN 230 that we recently reviewed. Now, it's completely unfair to make any direct comparisons between the picture performance of these two projectors. But Literally, one's like a $900 projector normally, the other one's like a $6,000 projector. But we'll, we'll compare anyway. <laughs> and you know what? We'll just see what that extra zero on the price tag of the SYN 230 gets you. First, let's start with the out-of-the-box performance of the HD 180. Uh, let's take a look at white balance. This is AKA how consistent its red, green, and blue color mixing is when creating shades of gray from black to white. That's a good definition there. And looking at the chart, you can see right out of the box, there's, there's there's a pretty dramatic bit of variance going on from, from dark black all the way, or black all the way to white. Uh, that is not what you want to see. That basically will affect the color performance of the whole picture. So in darker scenes, you're, you're basically getting color shifting that's unwanted and could affect, it affects how real or how convincing the scene's going to mm -hmm. look on the screen. Now, each distinct shade of gray should be the same color. That's why they call it color mixing. And as the RGB balance graph in the Calman software shows, there was some serious work needed to get everything tracking evenly at 100. It now, needed serious work. Oh, but <laughs> thankfully, that HD 180 provides a basic set of white balance controls that are pretty optimal for that very task. And as you can see, in the end, it, it came out looking pretty flat yes. across the board. Now, most entry-level projectors, including the HD 180, lack a color management system that can fine-tune primary and secondary colors to match the HD video spec. Green on the HD 180 was particularly oversaturated, and the secondary colors were all off to varying degrees. Yellows were especially shifted a little too toward red, more than you really want to see. Now, compare that to the out-of-the-box performance of the digital projection SYN 230, and you can understand where some of that extra cost is going in terms of just how is it performing right out of the box? How is it tuned at the factory, so to speak? Now, the display's gamma, any display's gamma, is a measurement of its light output at different input levels, and the result is logarithmic to match the response of the human eye. Now, the default gamma setting on the HD 180 appears to be optimized for producing extra brightness rather than an accurate picture. However, it turns out that the projector's standard gamma preset got us pretty close to the ideal. Nice. It took some, you know, it's basically going through each preset to see which one gets you closest, and there was one there that was pretty darn close. Lens-wise, here's where the big differences kick in. Oh boy. For the 92-inch Stuart film screen we used, that leaves us with a throw distance with the HD 180 of about 10 to 12 feet. Right. It's not a lot of wiggle room, really, in terms of where you're going to be placing that projector. The SYN 230, I believe, we had about 12 to 16 feet with, mm -hmm. the, with its lens package. And optional lens packages. And that's, I think that's what, one of the big things about high-end projectors, when I say high-end, um, for our audience, is, is starting at a few thousand dollars. That might be the low end for the true high-end. But the option, they, they offer a range of lens packages so that you can customize your lens to fit your room rather than making, you know, hanging the projector where you have to because of the single lens that comes with totally. the and low end projector. Projectors starting in, say, the, the $1,500 range mm -hmm. on up also include something called lens shifting, which rather than doing something, so say you need to, say you have the projector mounted in a specific spot, but you need that image to move down or up or left or right, you can actually mm -hmm. manipulate that with using just the lens movement rather than having to move the projector around. HD 180 doesn't have any of that. It's really becoming more a sense of you've got to put the projector in the right place to get the right. image squared up on the screen the way you want. Now, geometry of the picture as it's being projected out of the 180 was okay. There was some pin cushioning that was visible along the edges of the image. Also, sharpness and focus tended to drop off toward the outer edges of the image as well. Not as noticeable, though, in video content, but easier to spot with appropriate test patterns. I don't think you're really going to notice this mm -hmm. kind of degradation in lens clarity on the edges of the picture just by looking at regular video. That's something right. you really almost need a test pattern to pick and choose between the two. Now, the digital projection SYN 230's larger, more capable lens provided a wider range of throw, like I mentioned, and fewer distortions. But again, 10 times the cost. 
bottom line, uh, you have arguably one of the most convenient projectors that is not so expensive that you'd be afraid to say bring it outside for an impromptu theater in the backyard. I've got the toddler friendly projector. Uh, totally. <laughs> uh, it offers HDMI and analog video inputs. Uh, mm -hmm. a Two uh, the backlit remote is so bright, I was using it as a flashlight to get around the room. It is a brilliant backlit remote. It does uh, help round out the entire package. And for 1080p performance that you scored for under 700 bucks, it's one of those things that I, I truly think everyone should own, something like that. Hook your, hook your game console up to it, playing Wii on a 100-inch hundred, on screen, yeah. bring it out in the backyard for a secondary display for you know, sporting events or for fun. It's, there's a lot you can do, and because of the cost, isn't so crazy compared to like a high-end home theater projector. Mm -hmm. You're more willing to do it. Yeah. Take the risk. Yeah. Bring it by the pool. I just I, at this point, I just oh, can't yeah. own a projector that's worth more than my truck. No, <laughs> nor, nor should you, unless it's unless it's important and part of that that spending budget. <laughs> let me get this. Let me get the child out of school, then we'll talk about upgrading the projector. Hey, many of you have written in wondering what happened to the full list of Blu-ray releases this week is a perfect example. Blu-ray, it's mainstream. There were 56 movies wow. scheduled to be released today on Blu-ray. And I, I got to apologize. I know you want us to list all of them on air, and we will always put them all up on the episode page at tickzilla.com or hcnation.tv. But literally, when you read 56 titles, you're talking about like five minutes of just reading titles. Oh, it's a long list. It is. <laughs> I don't mind doing it, but hey. <laughs> hey, shall we do it? Let's do it. I think it's time. Yes, indeed. It is time for the new Blu-ray releases for the week of March 29th, 2011. First up, The Secret of Nim. This 1982 animated classic is a beloved favorite of many, including Roger and me. Based on a novel, it tells the story of a field mouse who has to save her son by enlisting the help of super intelligent rats from Nim, or the National Institute of Mental Health. All previous VHS and DVD releases of this film have been pan and scanned, but now we'll see it presented in the original widescreen 185 to 1 aspect ratio. Next up, Mad Men Season 4. This AMC series has won the Emmy Award for Outstanding Drama for the past three years in a row, and for good reason. The premise may sound uninteresting, it follows those who work in an ad agency in New York City in the 1960s, but it has some of the most interesting and well-developed characters on TV today. Season 4 comes region-free on a three-disc set with an MPEG-4 AVC codec, a 178 to 1 aspect ratio, and a DTS-HD Master Audio 5.1 soundtrack. Blu-ray.com gives the content, the video, and audio quality all a rating of 4.5 out of 5 each, saying, quote, the series has consistently raised the bar of just how filmic a series can actually look, unquote. They mention a few imperfections, but close with, it's almost curmudgingly to even discuss these niggling issues in light of just how brilliantly sharp and well-defined the fourth season of Mad Men looks on Blu-ray, unquote. Also released this week, Black Swan. This 2010 psychological thriller won Natalie Portman an Oscar, along with 25 other awards for that performance. This region free release comes in a 1080p AVC codec, 239 to 1 aspect ratio, and a DTS HD Master Audio 5.1 mix. It also comes with a digital copy, and Target is exclusively selling a combo pack with a DVD as well. Extras include four featurettes, including 10 Years in the Making, in which Natalie Portman and director Darren Aronofsky talk about the making of the film, a Fox Movie Channel special that focuses on the actors and their characters, a behind-the-curtain look at costume and production design, and finally, a three-part series that looks at the entire filmmaking process. As always, check out our show notes at techzilla.com or hdnation.tv for the rest of this week's Blu-ray releases. Hey, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, audible.com. Audible.com is the leading provider of downloadable digital audiobooks and spoken word entertainment. Audible has over 75,000 titles to choose from to be downloaded to your iPod MP3 player and played back anywhere, anytime. Choose from books in every genre, science fiction, thrillers, drama, comedies, business, history, and more. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash techzilla to get a free audiobook download of your choice when you sign up today. Again, go to audiblepodcast.com slash techzilla for your free audiobook. You can fix errors on Google Maps. You ever find one? I have, and I corrected it. I got a great email from Google. It said, hey, Patrick, your Google Maps problem report has been reviewed, and you were right. I felt so affirmed. <laughs> we'll update the map soon and email you when you can see the change. I can't tell you exactly how long it'll take for Google to stop directing people to a gated community in the Richmond San Pablo instead of the actual entrance around the corner a couple hundred yards of the pick and pull because I need parts for my truck. But now, now Google knows. It's kind of a crowdsourcing thing. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's, I promised on Twitter, correcting Google Maps is really easy. Just right click on the Google Map, 
select report a problem, select which element is wrong, street, address, one of the results, etc. There's a big old drop down list. Then type your correction into the problem descriptions box. If you're logged into Gmail, you'll get an email me when the problem is resolved. Checkbox, I check it because I, I like to know that they've heard from me. They'll confirm it or not. Basically, they'll decide if you're right. And if they have a correction, the goal is to, res quote, resolve each edit within a month. So hopefully, once they confirm it within 30 days, they'll have the corrections made to the website or their algorithm or whatever magnificent tool generates directions at Google Maps. If they can confirm your problem or solve it, having more folks submit the problem can help. Like if you're like, this is my business, the name is wrong, they don't want like one dude in Albuquerque to screw over all the other like dry cleaning businesses in Albuquerque by like filing <laughs> a, this is not a dry cleaning business, it is a pornography store because they don't want people to go there. Just Or maybe they did. Or maybe they do. But, but basically <laughs> have lots of people be like, this is actually Bob's dry cleaners. Please correct this to Bob's dry cleaners. And have all your the people, your customers email to try to fix that, right click and, and, and do the correction. I would love to get Google Maps on the show for an interview, some of the, the crew from over there. Let me know if you've got questions for them. We'll see if we can set that up. Nice. Hey, Bot Sarai has a driving question. Uh, <laughs> hey guys, what type of, <laughs> driving question, I'm like, what? Hey guys, what type of screwdriver do I need to undo this screw here? That black one in the attached photo. Hey, I'd say that's a, it looks like a Torx screw to me, but this is a secure Torx screw. Secure Torx bits? Now, you can pick up collections of security bits online at a lot of hardware stores, too. iFixit also sells that kind of stuff. Just really need to check around. Oh, man. I could have sworn I had that. This is not the collection of... I have, like, 32 collections of bits. Ooh. I thought I grabbed the right one. This the is the bottom one Torx? No. Uh, it is Torx, but it is not secure ah. Torx. Secure Torx is essentially that little pin in the center. So basically, you have to have a Torx with a hole cut out of the middle. So I noticed Muni uses a lot of those one-way screws. They can go on, but they don't come back off. Yeah, those those are almost impossible to undo without a <laughs> grinder or being really good with the chisels. Strips. <laughs> chisels work too. Hey, Adam ahead. wants to know how to migrate to Windows 7. Da -da -da -da. How do you recommend upgrading my computer from Windows 7 32-bit to Windows 7 64-bit? I want to use all six gigabytes of my RAM instead of just 3.25. A friend recommended backing up, doing a clean upgrade as x64. Wiping the hard drive and starting over and then restoring the backup. Would this work? Can you restore a 64-bit machine from a 32-bit backup? Thanks in advance. Signed, Adam in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That's a good question. Well, are we talking data on an actual disk image? Like you took a Cronus and you created an image of your existing install or carbon copy clone or something like that? Because if you image the disk, right? The whole point is to avoid reinstalling the operating system. Because right. if, you, if you take a disk image and blow it back onto the hard drive, you will erase your fresh 64-bit install. So that's not it. So I'm wondering yeah. if you used maybe the Windows backup tool that's built in I'm and pretty migrated sure Windows, data off. Like Windows backup tool, like the migration tools should work. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of, of the third-party tool that's been out there forever. Um, for, I don't know. for my. Aloha Bob. Is that the one, Aloha Bob? It sounds familiar. It sounds familiar. I haven't heard that um, name in a while, but I do remember that being a duel. There, I love a, the name. There's a couple other ones out there, but but basically, um, if you're talking about like your data, yeah, that's fine. Back them off to a hard drive, move them back on, but if you image a drive, you can't take a 32-bit image and drop it onto your 64-bit your image, because the image, right, if you restore an image, it's basically, it's not going like, hey, I put these files here, and I put no. those files there. An image is basically going, overwriting everything totally. on the disk. That's the whole point of creating a disk image. You would want to create a new 64-bit image of your disk as your backup. I, I'm tempted to say blow it out, start fresh, yeah. because some of the applications you use may have 64-bit versions right. that will give you impre increased performance, especially compression tools mm -hmm. in particular, I find, work really well when you can get them supported natively under 64-bit. Yeah, then there's the whole issue of like drivers. <laughs> Um, Drivers aren't so much of a problem anymore on newer gear. I mean, mm -hmm. Windows should pick up most of them, and then right. the few that are left over are usually pretty easy to track down. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff I love tinkering with, though, so I'm, I'm a little <laughs> oddball in that respect. But I, I'm of the belief when you're going to make that kind of transition between 32 versus 64, just start clean. Yeah. Save your data. Yes. Back up. Back up now. Make sure you know all the registration codes for any software you've paid for. That's the tough one. And Back game, up your bookmarks. Game Nothing saves. worse than erasing your bookmarks. I, I was like 90% of the way through uh, the original Dragon Age, and I, I I did just recently find my backup of it, though, so I'm a little happier. But anyway, I'm just, you lose some game data. You lose game data after you've been playing a game for a few hours, right. <laughs> a few, and it's a it's, it hurts. It's a sad maker. It is. You know, it's not sad making our sponsors like West Coast. How's that for an elegant transition? West Coast has been offering premium web hosting since 1998. 
affordable plans. They all start at 19 cents a day. Free us. Affordable plans start at just 19 cents a day. Free U.S.-based support, as in you can understand who's on the phone. They're available 24-7, phone, chat, and email. One-click installs for hundreds of apps, and they'll even transfer your website over to their hosting for free. Plus, you'll get a 60-day money-back guarantee and great server performance. Check them out, people. Westhost.com slash techzilla, and you'll score an exclusive 25% discount off web hosting. Westhost people, thank them for supporting us by, hey, trying out this offer. We got a lot of flack for admitting our total lack of Doctor Who fandom last week. At Lori CNET says we're no longer friends. At oh. Evercode took away some of my geek points. Uh, sorry about that. Oh, it, it's, it was actually kind of this hysterical discussion. So I actually, Lori over at CNET, uh, uh, who said we couldn't be friends anymore, did give me an episode. She suggested a sort of a gateway episode to hopefully hook me on Doctor Who. There you go. So I, I will attempt to, and, and also uh, on Twitter, I gave out a list of the British programming. I do actually watch uh, Red Dwarf. Actually, I, I spaced, actually, I'd never heard of a Simon Pegg thing. So I'm very excited. Awesome. Go along with Top Gear and, and Sherlock and a whole bunch of other good stuff. In any case, we can't love everything. Ah, hey, here's a cool <laughs> one. Campbell sent in a link to the unofficial Apple weblog and asks, quote, better than driving a Suburban over it, unquote? Basically, U.S. Air Force Combat Controller Ron Walker was leaning out of an airplane traveling at about 150 miles an hour at 1,000 feet in the air to look for landmarks when his Velcro pocket was ripped open by the wind and his iPhone 4 fell to the ground. He assumed <laughs> reasonably that it was destroyed, but later found it via the Find My iPhone app, and not only was it still functional, it didn't even have any dirt or scratches. Oh, uh, unreal. <laughs> he says he had had it in a Griffin Motif TPU case and an aftermarket metal backing on it. That and tree branches and needles helped likely slow down the iPhone's fall from 1,000 feet up. I can tell you right now, it did not land in ocean water. That <laughs> fried mine within seconds. <laughs> Saltwater, electronics, bad mix. I'm impressed. I, I am too. Some people are just luckier with hardware. Oh, I'm telling you. That's <laughs> awesome though. A thousand foot fall and not even a crack. Gorilla glass, man. Look it up. I bet he's going to be checking the Velcro on those pockets a little I, more closely. Uh, or a tether. Dear Jonathan Ives, <laughs> we, we need a loop on the iPhone. <laughs> Another email, Eric asks, on an episode, some guy said iMovie will work with any 264 720p 30 camera using the camera connection kit. I was wondering if this camera I found on Amazon would work with iMovie. I don't own an iPhone, and I know from trying it out that my current cameras can't export into iMovie. I don't want to buy anything until I know for sure it will work. I'm planning on doing light video editing while on vacation, and I don't want to take my laptop. Understood. That's the whole reason I got the iPad in the first place. Since it's for vacation, I want a small video camera that I can fit into my pocket and runs around 100 bucks or less. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the some guy was actually Anthony Carboni from ByteJacker, who's, who's our resident iPad 2 owner and enthusiast. In theory, if that camera gives you H.264 video at 720p, 30 frames per second, you should be able to edit it in iMovie. And Amazon says the camera delivers 30 frames per second at 720p with advanced H.264 technology, so you should be good. In reality, sometimes stuff that is supposed to be the right spec doesn't actually work. Uh, Amazon's got a solid return policy. I say buy the camera. If it doesn't work, return it. Just give yourself, you know, it, it, buy it now and find out if it works. That way you're not like, you know, doing two day Don't, prime yeah. shipping the day before you live. Leave that, that's the key. to find out whether or not it works. That is just, that'll put a spike in the, in the whole vacation plans. We, we can't test every camera out there either. In theory, it should work, but sometimes the things that should work don't, which is why we're employed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's why we're here to try it out when possible. And I love all caps questions. Take this one from David in North Carolina. Hi, guys. I love the show. I really, oh, no, <laughs> I really want an Apple TV, but I have a slightly older TV with no HDMI inputs. I do have a Pioneer AV receiver with HDMI in and out. Can I run the Apple TV into this and use component out to the TV? What kind of picture would I get if this works? Thanks for everything you do, signed David in North Carolina. Now, I did a little research, and David, if your Pioneer AVR does the digital to analog video conversion, then mm -hmm. I would think that you're all set. But that particular capability does seem to be, at least in the latest model, seems to be limited to Pioneer's elite models of audio video receivers. Right, right. I'm also assuming that you're talking about the Apple TV 2 that offers only HDMI output. If you were using the original Apple TV, that did have an option for component video out as well. Mm -hmm. And David, you didn't mention what specific TV you're using, but I'm going to guess that a single digital analog conversion won't render the whole experience unwatchable. 
You usually can get away with one of those. One. And the older TVs tend to treat those degraded yeah. signals a little bit better than the latest and greatest. But you will be getting SD. SD. Well, you probably will be getting SD at that point. Uh, maybe. Unless, uh, if this AV receiver has component output with right. digital inputs, you might be able to take it all up to 1080i. Right. But then again, I'm not sure what the TV supports, so. It could be an SD TV. I'm giving my best guess. Yeah. You, and you I did might. not mean to yell earlier, but <laughs> when I see all caps, I just fall into that mode in my it's fun. skull. You got a question about tech? You got a gadget one info on? Let us know. Kick us an email at techzilla at revision3.com. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. That's uh, youtube.com slash techhd. And there's always our forums. With all those ways to get in touch, there's no excuse. Send us your thoughts today, because we want to hear them. Nice. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Until next time, you've been watching Techzilla. Dude, Woot is dangerous. Woot is dangerous. No, you know what, man? Woot's really dangerous. So are, so are 55 inch TVs that fit in the space of a 46 inch TV. That's not going to help. I'm doomed. <laughs> See a battery over there? Blu-ray.com gives the content, the video, and the audio quality all, uh, all a rating of four and a half out of five. Three, <laughs> two. I'm guessing that a single digital analog conversion mm -hmm. really won't wender. 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 Wendery. We wender things all the time. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Uh, three. Uh, blah, 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 blah. All right.